Microcosmos by Rudolf Hermann Lotz 1817-1881 A work of metaphysics first published 1864 The principal ideas are that physicists are right in claiming that the universe is made up of atoms but the atoms are sentient they influence one another in a causal fashion predictable according to natural law the sentient atoms or monads may be considered causally from without but internally they are expressions of will all nature which is a mechanism directed by purpose is the expression of the creative will of god man is unique because of his mind although like the other animals man evolved in the struggle for existence his history cannot be understood in purely mechanical terms man who is himself a unity brings unity to existence by the use of ideas and ideals holes in nature are products of mind when he selected the title microcosmos for his book which is a great title yes rudolf hermann lotz drew upon the ancient tradition still strong in 18th and 19th centuries which taught that in the little circle of his activities man recapitulates the plan and purpose of the whole world as in the great fabric of the universe the creative spirit imposed on itself unchangeable laws by which it moves the world of phenomena diffusing the fullness of the highest good throughout innumerable forms and events and distilling it again from them into the bliss of consciousness and enjoyment so must man acknowledging the same laws develop given existence into a knowledge of its value and the value of his ideals into a series of external forms proceeding from itself a few years before the celebrated naturalist alexander von humboldt had begun the publication of a panoramic work entitled Cosmos in five volumes 1845 to 1862 designed to exhibit in an imaginative synthesis all that was known about the physical world Lotz's microcosmos sought in a manner to redress the balance by focusing attention on man and his achievements Volume 1 is an account of the human constitution in its physical, vital and psychical aspects. Volume 2 deals with the physical evolution of man and his mental and social development. Volume 3 discusses the meaning of history, not neglecting its metaphysical and theological presuppositions. For this grandiose undertaking, Lotz was well qualified to his philosophical labours he brought the prestige of a man of science reminding us in this respect as in others of the philosopher and mathematician alfred north whitehead the same year that he took his doctor's degree in philosophy he received the degree of doctor of medicine and his writings on metaphysics and logic were interspersed with works of with works on physiology pathology and medical psychology microcosmos exhibits the result of his labors in these fields lots purpose in writing microcosmos was to adjust the differences which divided the educated world of his day into two warring camps naturalists and humanists materialists and spiritualists or what william james was later to call the tough-minded and the tender-minded like james lotz believed that the truth lies somewhere between the 
exclusive claims of these parties. He blamed the former for making an idol of truth and renouncing human interests, which no man has the right to renounce. But he lamented the irrationalism in which romantic defenders of art, morality and religion were accustomed to wrap themselves. It was his opinion that the philosophy which takes the realm of value as its starting point is able to frame a consistent and intelligible account of the world by tracing things back to their origin in the purpose of a personal good. And he further argued that the scientific views of the world is not scientific view of the world is not fully intelligible except on the same assumption. The key to Lotz's proposal for bringing the world view of science into harmony with the world view of aesthetics, morals and religion is his attitude toward the principle of mechanism. He maintained that the universe is indeed made up of atoms and that these act upon one another in a regular necessary fashion that can be described in terms of mechanical law. He saw no necessity for limiting or qualifying this causal principle. Some philosophers, in order to preserve freedom and responsibility for man, had set up a, a dualism of body and soul, arguing that mechanism holds for the former, but not for the latter. Others had declared for a spiritual monism, maintaining that matter is merely phenomenal and that the chain of causation which appears to determine its movements has no reality in things themselves. Lotz rejected both of these views. He did accept a kind of spiritual monism. The atoms known to physics he held to be actually sentient, like the monads in Leibniz's system. Leibniz, however, had denied that one monad really influences another, explaining their apparent interconnection by his theory of pre-established harmony. Lotz held that they do influence each other, and that their behaviour is predictable in terms of law. At the time he wrote, many biologists were contending that mechanistic determinism does not apply to living things. Lotz maintained in his works on physiology that it does, and he did not hesitate to speak of the mechanism of life. To that extent, Lotz accommodated himself to the views of science. But having admitted that mechanism is universal, he went on to argue that it is everywhere subordinate to purpose. If we consider the atom not from the outside but from within, causality appears in a different aspect. Its essence may be described as feeling and its activity toward other atoms as excitation and impulse. Nineteenth century materialists were divided into two groups those who maintain that atoms are qualitatively homogeneous and those who maintain that they are heterogeneous. Lotz took the latter position. He held that each monad or particle has a determined essence which draws along with it a definite series of possible changes. As it comes into relation with other things, it responds in specific ways. Viewed from without, its behaviour may be described in terms of law. Viewed from it within, it is the realisation of inclination or will. Like Leibniz, Lotz required a principal monad to complete the picture. Existing things, both existing things, each ceaselessly acting to realise its own satisfaction, are joined and fitted into harmonious wholes which in turn go to make up one concordant system, the expression of the creative will of God. It is in the notion of a whole that Lotz found the complement to mechanism which, without subverting causal necessity, subordinates it to an idea. The upshot is that mechanism is everywhere operative, but as is the case with the artifices of men, 
the laws of nature serve to realize ends. Lotz's reason for believing that there are unities in the world derives from the peculiarity of mental phenomena. The customary reason given for distinguishing between mind and matter is, according to Lotz, that the one exercises freedom of self-determination, which is forbidden to the other. This theory he found inadequate because there is no evidence that conscious choices are determined. Our feeling of freedom could be misleading if it is true that even material particles share with minds the attribute of excitability. The true ground for distinguishing between mind and matter lies in the unity of consciousness, which is totally unlike the kind of unity that we encounter among natural phenomena. On the material plane, two forces, when they combine to produce a third, merge so as to become indistinguishable. But consciousness keeps its objects separate at the same time that it combines them. In this way, it gives rise to genuine wholes. Lotz held that it is only in virtue of consciousness, gods or man's, that wholes exist. Moreover, he argued, from the fact that minds perceive unity to the unity of minds themselves, it may not appear to us that consciousness is anything but an unconnected plurality, but the very fact that anything which appears does so to us, or that the world appears to us as made up of unities, is proof incontestable. For only that which is itself a unity can unify manifold phenomena. Lotz regarded man as occupying a unique status in the world. He is, and I quote, a phenomenon in space, a connected organism, the head of the animal kingdom, end quote. But at the same time, he is set off from the rest of creation by, and I quote, the addition of a wholly new germ of development, end quote. Namely, the rational mind. Writing before the publication of Darwin's On the Origin of Species of 1859, he laid the groundwork for a mechanistic theory of evolution, including the notions of variation and the selection of existing varieties through the struggle for existence. Nor did he accept man from this scheme, but he discerned a deep abyss between the natural history of animals and the intellectual and moral history of the human species. The former can be adequately accounted for in mechanical terms, the latter not by those means at all. Microcosmos is the account of man's peculiar development within creation. The story of a creature made in the image of God. Lotz did not deny that animals have souls, but he did claim that we know too little about animals to speak intelligently on the subject. Their outer lives are all we have to go by. Presumably they experience sensation and desire much as man does, and they cannot be without a kind of intelligence. But as far as we can tell, they stop short of attaching significance to their experiences and their actions. A dog may find a morsel pleasant to the taste without attaining to a recognition of sweetness. He may bury a bone, but without the thought of providing for tomorrow's need. Man, on the contrary, lives by taking thought, by bringing to bear upon the manifold content of sensation and desire an architectonic structure which transforms the raw product of psychic stimulation into an organically utilizable thought atom, as Lotz puts it. Only in view of this creative or recreative function can human phenomena be explained. The bird's song, the beaver's dam, the monkey's capers can all be understood in terms of mechanistic principles. But failure awaits the attempt of materialists. 
For example, Ludwig Bucher's Force and Matter, 1855, which I will post on later, to explain the achievements of man by appealing to natural laws. A second principle of explanation must be employed which takes account of the ideas and holes. From this latter point of view, Lotz surveyed the whole range of human culture, the structure of language, with its parts of speech and rules of syntax, is the first embodiment of thought closely followed, closely following its natural forms. Man's intellectual life, as observable in science and abstract reasoning, further discloses the unique formative activity of the mind as it compares and distinguishes impressions and uncovers relations and connections which it did not originate, lifting out of their spatio-temporal context orders and patterns and beholding their timeless essence. Morality shows similar features, inasmuch as man, unlike the lower creatures, is motivated by ideal principles of duty and obligation and not merely by animal impulse. In all his specifically human achievements, man reveals the presence of mind, not indeed to the exclusion of his body and its laws. Sensation, according to Lotz, is caused by physiological stimulation. The chemical reactions in the brain affect the soul in specific ways giving rise there to colour, taste and sound impressions. Impressions such as these are the basis for its perceptions. Language originates in, in spontaneous physiological movements of the respiratory system. Morality is rooted in feelings of pain and pleasure, and when man formulates ideal ends, he is still motivated by antipathy and desire. Lotz claimed that it was proof of the correctness of his theory that it brought together the theory of an individual unity in mental life and the theory of its mechanical realization. And if this work was directed in the first instance against crude materialism and its attempts to explain civilization in mechanical terms, it was also intended as a corrective of absolute idealism. Hegel, in other words, which... Lot said, and I quote, makes the significant idea float in isolation as a boundlessly shaping power above the low sphere of the ordinary psychic mechanism, end quote. It may be gathered from this quotation that Lotz would not be in sympathy with Hegel's philosophy of history, and this was indeed the case. Instead of conceiving history as the logical unfolding of an idea, Lotz viewed it as the interaction between man and his environment. The human mind does not work in a vacuum. In fact, it does not work at all except under the stimulating and guiding influence of various external causes. We may view human activity as an attempt to realize the good, the beautiful, the just, for these are the ends which man comes to respect, but these goals would never have been sought for themselves apart from man's bodily and communal needs. And in this connection, such unspiritual factors as climate and rainfall have to be considered as well as the claims of the ideal. Lotz saw a development in history because of favorable circumstances or because of the possession of peculiar genius or a specially pregnant idea. Certain peoples, at least, have developed forms of life which far transcend organic needs and in the West, particularly, an overlapping of cultures has permitted later ones to build upon their predecessors' achievements. But Lotz was not greatly impressed with the doctrine of progress as such. In mechanical arts, he granted it was not difficult to improve upon the achievements of one's predecessors. But he doubted whether there was any progress in art or in the depth and character of mental life from one civilization to another.
Lotz found special difficulty in another feature of the progress doctrine. It seemed to him irreconcilable with any consistent scheme of values to argue that countless generations of individuals should serve as means to the happiness of those who should come after. On the contrary, he maintained that the life of any generation in any culture has the same intrinsic worth as that of any other, that the whole of history makes up a pattern and has a meaning he was far from denying, but he held that only God knows what it is or can have any satisfaction from it. In fact, Lotz applied the same principle to the cosmos that he applied to history, and one of the reasons which inclined him to view the elemental parts of nature as sentient was his unwillingness to suppose that the vast proportion of the world has no enjoyment of it and exists only for the satisfaction of men. The arguments by which Lotz arrived at his conception of God as a personal creator are of such a subtle and metaphysical order that it is unprofitable to try and summarize them. Sorry, slight interruption there. Lotz was prepared to prove that the notion of causation presupposes a more fundamental being underlying the interacting particles. His background in chemistry and biology led him to repudiate the notion that atoms are inert, extended bodies which interact on one another through external collision. He favoured a dynamic conception which explained causation in terms of the internal constitution of things. This led to his discerning patterns or holes in nature, which he held can have no existence apart from a mind which thinks them. The notion that the world is called into being by a purely ideal necessity, as Hegel had suggested, seemed to him inadequate to account for the actuality which things possess, and the real causality which they exert on one another. To account for the active quality of existence, he believed it was necessary to hold to an active God who wills and enjoys as well as thinks. When Lotz turned from physical causation to the consideration of value, he found further arguments for a personal creator. He opposed Kant's contention that the highest good is a will determined purely by duty. To make an abstract relation, a good seemed to him altogether contrary to experience. In reality, nothing is good except self-satisfaction. A benevolent act is good only if it brings happiness to some other being. And to Lot, since values are as much a constituent part of the world as existence and law, it was necessary to think of the Creator as the one for whom things have preeminent worth. He ventured with these thoughts before him to trace the origin of our world to God's eternal love, which, rejoicing in the goodness of his own thoughts, willed that they should have their own existence. Because creation was an act of love, it was not enough that God should enjoy it, but the parts themselves, each in its determinate measure, must know the self-satisfaction of being what they are. Lord's philosophy has many loose ends. He reminds himself repeatedly that the finite mind of man, while it can trace the general features of the world, cannot expect to see its ultimate necessity. No philosopher was ever more, well, would they know, but he certainly showed a sophistication, that is to say, not quite naive, if he returns to an essential religious tradition, which can be naive, and fact philosophical suicide in some cases, he does so with due deliberation. It might be true of Kant that his philosophy was 
and elaborate rationalization of his pietistic faith. This was hardly the case with Lotz, who saw the nihilistic implications in official 19th century philosophies and was impelled to take a longer look. He concluded, on the one hand, that our science can never be more than fragmentary and he warned against exaggerating its findings into systems which impoverish faith without enriching knowledge. On the other hand, he felt fast to what he called the old-fashioned conviction that there are ways of leading, that there are ways leading to fuller light and that it is man's duty to follow them as far as he can.